this march will go down as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, uh, demonstrations for freedom and human dignity ever held in the United States. We're going to march. We're going to walk together. We're going to stand together. We're going to sing together. We're going to stay together. We're going to moan together. We're going to groan together. And after a while, we'll say, freedom, freedom, freedom now. When I left the house in the morning, I didn't tell my mother where I was going. She thought I was going to work um, because those kinds of activities were considered extremely dangerous in those days. You never knew what uh, the outcomes were going to be, and I didn't want her to be worried about uh, my um, safety. We boarded the bus in Baltimore. The bus was not a charter service, it was just an old bus. And on the way to Washington, it was so quiet on that bus. Everybody was so quiet. They only whispered to each other. And I thought maybe that was kind of strange. Before going, there were thoughts of, uh, you know, what might happen, what could happen, why these things could happen how easily they could happen. And listening to the uh, news media from the various events from down south and a lot of the uh, horrifying things that were going on and that had happened to different individuals or people, the marches and so forth, yes, there was a, uh, there was a fear. When we got into Washington, the driver stopped at a place uh, in near the, not as far as the buses could go. And as soon as he stopped, up stepped a white policeman. And he, there were three men on the corner. They began to laugh. He told the driver, if you don't get this bus away from here, I'm gonna lock you up. So he politely told him, well, I have some elderly people on here that I just wanted to let off. And in a very authoritative manner, he said, I'll lock up everybody on that bus. And my heart sort of skipped a beat because in those days, they did lock people up. In the civil rights work I've been doing previously, I got to know people like the uh, uh, Roy Wilkins and uh, Whitney Young because at that same time we were passing the first public accommodations law in the state of Maryland and I was in charge of that effort and I went on the staff of the State Department then to continue the work with the African diplomats at the time that the march was planned and I became a marshal. Were you fearful to attend the March on Washington that day? No, because we had the March on Washington was accomplished before it got here before it got to D.C. The March on Washington really was made up of people who had been at this for a good while. Now those who were coming from places like the Deep South and folk knew they were coming uh, may have found some local resistance, but the city was prepared. It's something I had to do. I had to be there that day. I had watched my parents uh, exist under the weight of segregation and I felt that life and living uh, did not have a whole lot of value under those circumstances. I was uh, 29 years old at the time of the march and um, I had been participating with some of the local civil rights groups uh, in the Baltimore area and that's where I lived at the time. I attended because I had to. There was, there was no thought of not attending. My older brother uh, had already started to become very much involved with African American affairs. And he had lived in New Orleans uh, during some of the worst 
periods in the South. And uh, in fact, his car was firebombed by the Ku Klux Klan right outside his house. That's, that was my background. And uh, I didn't change. I mean, it, it just was something I, I wanted to do. We had not had a major assembly of black people uh, organized by black people in the United States uh, up until that time without some fear of violence or obstruction or what have you. And so I wanted to be there even if it meant uh, possible danger to myself. I attended for several reasons. One was that uh, my husband and I had been stationed down in the Deep South during the Second World War. He was in the Air Force. And we were quite disturbed by the amount of segregation and um, discrimination we found down there. We were anxious to know if there was something we could do to help. And we felt that civil rights was not just for one group of people, that it should be for everybody. It should be inclusive. I felt like uh, I had something to contribute. I felt like something was needed to change the racial mood here in the county. I felt like uh, I had a responsibility to do what little that I could do to try and change it. And by attending the March on Washington that perhaps this would uh, give me some ideas or at least give me somewhat of a foundation to work on the situation here locally. As we were approaching uh, the D.C. area, we began to see uh, more buses. And uh, there were people actually walking on the shoulder, groups of 25 to 50 people uh, walking with their signs. We're walking to Washington. There was actually a march to get to the march. But the crowd was so, so large that when we finally parked the car and we headed to the march, I'm thinking, well, are we already in the march? Because the crowd was so massive. And then we got on to Constitution Avenue and we got in the regular march. Well, I'm thinking, the march started way back when we got out of the car. This is how thick uh, the, the crowd was. This is how massive the numbers were. We had not expected to get into such a, a large group. Uh, bus after bus was coming. It kept coming. <laughs> it just kept on coming and coming, so it was Quite an awesome experience. I was in awe uh, of the situation. I was in awe of the fact that here I stand in such a massive group of individuals. Even then, you have to stop and think about the consequences of what you're doing. You have to understand that not everybody out there agrees with you. You have to understand that there are people out there who really want to hurt you for this particular movement because these individuals do not want this movement to take place. They do not want integration. We recognize that it is not only in America that the battle for freedom and dignity of peoples is being waged. The struggle toward freedom on the part of the previously subjugated is occurring in capitals and villages all over the world. It is on our awareness of what this struggle means and in the degree of our dedication to it that our futures and the future of the world depend. In my mind, 
And I said to uh, some of the people that were with me, you know, what do we do here? You know, if, if something goes wrong. And uh, everybody was saying, don't even think about that. Everything's going to be fine. It, it was a, a, a beautiful day. It was a day that really God made that day particularly for that particular march. I, for one, expected I'd see a lot of people who were rather local and the heads of other organizations that were national, but only the heads of the organizations would be there. But folk indeed showed up, and they showed up in large numbers. Those newsreels that you see now already show, people came as they were. You had groups of people who Obviously, we're from different cultures, but different backgrounds, different races, different dress, different mannerisms. Looking to the left of us as we marched, in our particular line, I noticed there were white people. There was an Oriental. Uh, there was Hispanics. And that was just in the line in, in the line that I was in as we crossed Constitution Avenue. It told us how, to what extent, this um, inhumanity uh, stretched. And it wasn't just our little group in Merlin that was uh, chafing under this kind of uh, rudeness, but all over the country there were other people, pockets of other uh, people having the same problems. The world on that day was very well represented race-wise, cultural-wise, in pretty much anything else you can think of. Some of them had ridden the bus since Friday morning, and the buses were old, and the people were old, and they were so determined to come to Washington. They had already been involved in the Civil Rights Movement in their various locations, in their various communities, and they came together there. So we had this beautiful group of you know, humanity all having their own uh, issues, but they were there to say, we support you. I felt like I understood a little bit more of the feelings of my sisters and brothers of another race. And as I looked out over the group, uh, it gave me a feeling of what the people had been going through that were there, and yet there was a quiet dignity. God of history and of all mankind, God of Abraham and Moses, Amos and Isaiah, Jesus and Paul, God of our weary years, God of our silent years, pour out thy benediction upon the United States of America. It was an amazing thing. It was an unbelievable thing. This is the day that God has drawn together all of these people to demonstrate to the world that the movement is on, that we shall overcome. As you traveled through the group, it reached a point where the mood changed to one where people were engaging themselves and entertaining themselves, doing things with their children and everything, and listening, but also engaged in things around them with other people and meeting people. As the evening wore on, that was kind of a, uh, a picnic or family reunion atmosphere. People were coming up to you, looking you in the face, smiling, giving their names. And that was really intriguing. The, what was going on up front tended almost just to make a back drop for people just enjoying themselves for being there. I was a bit apprehensive. I can't say it was exactly being afraid, but I was apprehensive about it. And uh, 
I wouldn't have had to have been because as soon as we got there, we experienced a very wonderful attitude. We wanted the day to go well without an incident because the world was watching. Everywhere you looked, there were TV cameras. Uh, and so it wasn't just us on display, it was America on display. You had the BBC, uh, the uh, people from other countries were there to film this event. We believe that it's going to have its effect on the image of our country all over the world because it will indicate that not only are Negroes struggling to achieve a transition from second class to first class citizenship, but that our white brothers and sisters are marching arm in arm with the Negro citizens of the country. As people talked to one another throughout the crowd, these words were pitched back and forth, unity and freedom. Today, we are unified. We are unified today to, because we stand for what? We stand for freedom. Freedom from oppression, freedom from segregation, this sort of thing, to be free, to have the right to choose. At that time, blacks couldn't vote, and uh, you couldn't go in many of the public places downtown and try on clothes. Uh, and other insults to one's dignity. Somebody once said, why are you worried about where you sit on the bus as long as you're on the bus? I'm not worried about where I sit on the bus. What I'm concerned about is my right to sit where I want to on the bus. There were so many things during that period. The sit-ins, the murders, the images of, of children being escorted to school by members of the military. A lot of people thought that by uh, not making any uh, disturbance or not uh, upsetting anybody, we could uh, achieve favor by uh, just going along to get along but uh, that wasn't working very well. We had experienced 100 years of that. These people were all present, but the mood was set to the point that I think everybody in that group was waiting for one thing, the moment that Dr. King came on. I would simply like to say that I think this has been one of the great days of America. And I think this march will go down as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, uh, demonstrations for freedom and human dignity. We didn't know what he was going to say, but we all had our collective fingers crossed, hoping that he wouldn't trip up or say something that we deemed embarrassing. Uh, we hoped that he would uh, do uh, quite well, and he did not disappoint. When he talked about, I have a dream, and he talked about people being judged by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin or their race. Uh, how can you say it better than he did? His speech uh, was somewhat of a history lesson, okay, because at that time I didn't realize that uh, March 28th, 63, uh, was the anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation signed by uh, President Lincoln. It was 100 years, and all we had experienced from that point on was the uh, 
same thing that we had during slavery, only other, under other names, okay, Jim Crow or whatever. And so much of what he talked about, we didn't get in our classrooms, okay. There's not a lot of talk about uh, black history. I learned a whole lot about Western civilization and those kinds of things, but I knew absolutely nothing about my own history as a African-American, okay. People were happy and uh, they were yelling praise the Lord and all when Dr. King spoke, but they seemed very, very happy. It was like going to the seashore and seeing a wave come in. The wave started out as just a gentle swell and as he increased in his volume and increased, everybody started to get quieter and to, he, he just pulled everybody into what he was saying. And it was just like the wave got stronger and stronger and finally it just broke when he got to I Have a Dream. From every mountainside he said, let freedom ring. And when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and hamlet, from every state and city, we will be able to speed up that, up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, excuse me. Free at last, free at last. Great God Almighty, I'm free at last. Find the answers in the light of reason. Can we be certain that the apostles of hatred will not search for the answers in the darkness of night? I felt uh, extremely uh, elated, uh, but I didn't talk about having gone to the march the next day at work. They were firing people when they found that someone who was participating in the movement, uh, they suddenly uh, lost their jobs. And so I did not uh, mention even to uh, other black people, because you never knew who you were talking to, and not all of them were in favor of what we were doing. I know that in, over the last 48, nine years, uh, there's been a lot of progress made. Well, I expected overnight <laughs> success, that things would get better overnight, which didn't happen, and I guess it was foolish to believe that it would. I always have some concerns uh, about how much has changed with some people. When massive change comes, it's going to meet resistance. But if the change has a true meaning, has a good foundation, it's unstoppable. The, dem the march on Washington was telling the world, the storm is coming then you can't stop it. The fact that it was peaceful, um, uh, the fact that it was successful, the fact that it drew the absolute positive response all over the world. It gave, and it may seem that it was not necessary, but it gave legitimacy to the civil rights movement everywhere, even in the Deep South. Even today, I am so glad that I went and um, I joy at having a feeling of being there. When it comes on TV, but I had a dream, and I think, oh, I was there. I told my kids, my grandkids, I was there when you said that. This history, along with the March on Washington, should be repeated over and over and over. The reason the young folks don't understand it or don't realize it is because we don't teach it enough. Don't leave it up to the schools. It starts in your house. It starts in your home. 
tell the story, show the story, and let young folks understand from whence they come.